What's the scoop? It's SMA Program Lifecycle Live Week 2, and I'm your host, Sophie Kimball. Let's begin by recognizing Juneteenth. John Hopkins Assistant Dean Joel Bowling shared some compelling statistics. Between 1619, when the first enslaved Africans arrived in America, and 1863, there were 244 years of slavery, spanning eight to 10 generations. Bowling remarked, Juneteenth marks the end of such a terrible time in history, so to celebrate this day is a powerful lesson. Next, we turn our attention to current global affairs with our resident expert, Greg Treverton. Greg has been an SMA ad executive advisor in our management consulting practice since 2017. He previously served as the chair of the National Intelligence Council under two US presidents and is a professor of practice at Thornsife College at the University of Southern California. Here's an excerpt from Greg's latest piece on the NATO defense ministers. Winston Churchill gets credit for saying, jaw jaw is better than war war. Though that's not quite what he actually said in 1954. What is sadly paradoxical about these times is that the jawing and the warring are going on in tandem. Indeed, the jawing may be driven by the warring. Surely that is true for the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, who has practically assumed diplomatic residence in the Middle East. Further diving into Greg's analysis, last week, NATO defense ministers convened in Brussels to prepare for the upcoming NATO summit in Washington, scheduled for early July. Treverton highlights that the irony that Putin's invasion of Ukraine has unexpectedly revitalized NATO's relevance, contrasting with earlier expectations during the Cold War when NATO's significance was anticipated to diminish alongside the Soviet Union. A focal point of the minister's discussions was the formulation of a comprehensive long-term assistance and training strategy for Ukraine. Despite challenges such as Hungary's conditional approval without financial contribution, NATO's operational flexibility, capable of practical actions despite theoretical constraints, was underscored. The NATO meeting followed the G7 summit, where major Western economies and the EU agreed to utilize frozen Russian assets to fund loans for Ukraine. Additionally, Washington announced expanded sanctions targeting financial institutions dealing with Russia, including potential ties from China. Moreover, a 10-year security pact with Ukraine was unveiled, featuring the transfer of five additional Patriot missile defense batteries. However, restrictions remain on deploying longer-range U.S. weaponry against non-Kharkiv targets in Russia. Looking forward, the NATO summit in Washington will serve as a pivotal moment for the alliance. It presents an opportunity to demonstrate solidarity with Ukraine and its president, Vladimir Zelensky. The key challenge will be balancing substantial security assurances for Ukraine without committing to immediate NATO membership. Notably, French President Emmanuel Macron's proposal to de deploy troops in Ukraine for training purposes resonates amid these discussions. Allies are also aiming to centralize aid coordination through NATO to safeguard against potential policy shifts from the United States. In conclusion, this juncture calls for decisive action akin to Ronald Reagan's famous appeal to tear down that wall. Maintaining this resolve is crucial for NATO as it navigates current geopolitical challenges. That was an in-depth look at NATO's recent developments. Thank you, Greg. Now let's shift gears to our next topic. Chuck Goddard, one of our vice presidents of business development, shared with us some insights about Eastern shipbuilding. Here's what he had to say about our client. Eastern Shipbuilding Group, ESG, is a privately owned small business based in Panama City, Florida. Eastern's original shipyard was established in 1967 for building commercial fishing boats by its founder and president, Brian DeCernia. Soon after constructing impressive boats for his fleet, fishermen from New England, the Pacific Northwest, and even Alaska began requesting customized vessels. By 1980, 26 commercial fishing vessels had been completed and delivered. Expanding on this success, Mr. Discernia diversified Eastern's portfolio in the 1980s to include offshore supply vessels. 
From there, ESG broadened its scope to include various ship types, including the pivotal award of the United States Coast Guard, USCG, Offshore Patrol Cutter, OPC, detailed design and construction in 2016. Today, Eastern has evolved into one of the most diverse mid-tier shipbuilding companies, having constructed over 350 vessels in the past 48 years. Eastern has built everything from USCG OPCs to articulated tug and barge units with a portfolio that includes offshore supply vessels, vehicle passenger ferries, dredges, research ships, and more. Currently, the company is led by Brian's son, Joey, who serves as the chairman and CEO, along with other family members in key roles, continuing the family tradition of constructing high quality, affordable ships. ESG currently operates three shipyards on the Florida Gulf Coast. The first is Nelson Shipyard in Panama City, completing OPC construction by mid-2028. The second is Alantan Shipyard in Panama City, housing their steel processing facility, commercial ship construction, and OPC system integration lab. And finally, the third is Port St. Joe Shipyard, providing construction, outfitting, and sustainment for both commercial and government vessels. SMA is supporting ESG's proposal for the U.S. Navy's medium landing ship, LSM, with a full proposal team including an executive executive capture advisor, proposal manager, volume leads, program architect, integrated master schedule lead, a graphic artist, and a production manager. The proposal was submitted June 13th, and we are standing by to support discussions with the Navy. This has been a great opportunity for SMA, which Chuck personally, along with Ryan Sherman, has enjoyed supporting. <laughs> the LSM effort will largely be conducted at ESG's Nelson Shipyard, with a workforce transitioning seamlessly from OPC to LSM. This shipyard spans 40 acres with 930 feet of deep water pier space, directly leading to St. Andrews Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. The Atlantan Shipyard will aid in the construction by performing steel processing for the LSM program. The locations of the two Panama City Eastern Shipyards are, shown in the following image, with easy access to the Gulf Coast for testing and trials, including the unconventional Builders Beaching Trials. Can you imagine a Navy ship landing on a beach during spring break in Florida? Then again, the beaches are a perfect match for the expected landing zones in the Pacific Ocean. Eastern Shipbuilding is the largest private sector employer in Northwest Florida and was awarded the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Small Business of the Year in 2017. The company's commitment to education, training, and opportunities for students extends far and wide in Bay County. In 2021, ESG was proud to support the opening of a new welding facility at the local high school in Panama City to train students to become welders for new programs such as LSM. Thank you so much, Chuck, for that enlightening overview. Up next, we have John Pryor, Vice President of Management Consulting, who shared with us the inside scoop on SMA's position to win approach. What if I told you the winning bid on an upcoming Department of Defense program would be $100,546,000? What would you do with that information? Are you more or less likely to win knowing the awarded price? Your answer is probably, it depends. You're right, of course. Price is only one variable when selecting winners. Depending on how the request for proposal is structured, price is often not even the most important factor for buyers when choosing a winning bid. If that's true, then why do companies do price to win at all? Price to win, or PTW, has become shorthand for a larger body of work that must be conducted to determine how one's competitors are positioning their offers to win and how customers will value and score proposed solutions. SMA calls this comprehensive approach position to win. Ultimately, all competitions have a trade space to compare awardable offers. At one end are LPTAs, or lowest price technically acceptable bids. These solutions offer a bare bones approach at a reasonable price. 
At the other end are the AOCs, or Affordable Objective Capabilities. These solutions provide the most capable solutions at the highest affordable price. Winning bidders understand customer needs and price sensitivities and position themselves to maximize both price and non-price value. Understanding where your competitors are relative to their offering and likely customer award preferences is essential, but insufficient for determining what you should offer and at what price. Once you determine that your competitors may be in a better position than you, you generally have two options. First, assuming you still have time to change your technical solution or influence customer requirements meaningfully, you can rethink your offer to improve your non-price score significantly, outflanking your competitors in technical performance. However, the closer you are to proposal submission, your ability to either develop a new solution or radically improve your current solution is highly constrained. In this case, you have another option, radically take out cost. Knowing where your competitors sit allows you to rethink how to deliver your offering. Considering the full range of business processes and systems, you can reimagine how you, your teammates, and your supply chain partners can improve the price so that customers will be compelled to buy your solution regardless of your competitors' technical advantages. Although difficult to achieve, Knowing your competitor's position relative to customer price and non-price preferences, you can make informed decisions about how far you are willing to go to win the contract. The bottom line is, don't miss the forest for the trees. Winning means shaping customer perceptions and outmaneuvering the competition. Although price is important, it is only one aspect of a complex and dynamic landscape. Positioning to win requires long-term consideration of cost and non-price factors, understanding customer and competitor actions, and responding appropriately. This is one popular SMA offering that the team and John are well-versed in, especially in supporting clients. Thank you so much for these valuable insights, John. Next, we caught up with Jacques Keats, our Chief Operating Officer, for an update on our summer interns. Here's the latest. Our summer interns, Zai and Alexander, just finished their first week and they hit the ground running. They quickly navigated through all of the onboarding documents and process, got their laptop dialed in, and made rounds to get introduced to everyone at headquarters. They spent 30 minutes with each of us to ask questions about what we do, our career journey, and our core values. Both Zai and Alexander each constructed a survey that they sent to the SMA virtual staff and our management consulting team to get introduced to the culture at SMA. The survey included detailed questions that included philosophy, pulp culture likes, and prompts about values. These surveys are well-crafted and will provide some interesting insights. Equally impressive is that everyone responded so quickly. <laughs> Jacques had the opportunity to go to lunch with these bright interns and discuss their career goals, school, and extracurricular activities. They both attend the same high school, take AP and honors classes, and play on the varsity baseball team. They're both looking forward to starting their senior year and are still finalizing where they'll attend college in 2025. Next, they'll start a project with Alan Berman to help round out our expert network and Todd. If you have not had the chance to chat with these impressive budding professionals, please take the time to connect. I know that they would appreciate the opportunity to meet you and you will definitely enjoy meeting them. We will provide periodic updates on their progress over the next few weeks. Well, thank you Jacques for that update. I'm definitely looking forward to hearing about their internship progress. Next, Let's hear from Vice Presidents of Business Development, Tom Hernandez and Andrea Crofton about their recent attendance at the annual conference of the American Society of Military Controllers, ASMC for short, Professional Development Institute. This year's conference took place last month in Phoenix, Arizona at the Downtown Convention Center. ASMC's flagship training event, the National Professional Development Institute, 
or PDI for short, rotates to different cities across the country annually. This three-day hybrid event enriches the knowledge and skills of financial managers from the Department of Defense, the U.S. Coast Guard, and private and public sectors. PDI focuses on best practices to address the intricate challenges of today's fiscal landscape, aligned with the five strategic goals of the DOD FM strategy. Sessions included briefings by senior military leaders for contractors to assess business opportunities, technical sessions on the latest software, and training for continuing education credits. Tom and Andrea engaged with clients specializing in audit and financial management, such as Deloitte, KPMG, Aon, Ernest & Young, Guidehouse, and Kearney. Tom highlighted productive meetings with KPMG and Deloitte, while Andrea found success with Kearney and Company, Aon, and several smaller vendors providing financial management and audit readiness services across the DOD. In this week's Art Flash, we feature artist Mark Bradford, recipient of the esteemed Getty Prize, which he presented to the Arts for Healing and Justice Network. Now over to Sarah for more on Bra Mark Bradford and his remarkable artwork. Over to you, Sarah. He was born in South Los Angeles, but he moved to Santa Monica with his mother when he was 11 years old. And throughout his childhood, he worked in his mother's beauty salon in Lamert Park, where he first developed his curiosity in artistic and creative expression. And after high school, Bradford spent his summers traveling in Europe. He went on to receive his BFA and his MFA from Cal Arts in Valencia. And he's known for his grid-like abstract paintings, combining collage with paint. His works are usually made out of layers of paper and cords, which he carves into using various tools and techniques, including tearing, shredding, gluing, power washing, and sanding. In 2023, he had one of his largest solo exhibits at Hauser & Wirth Gallery in New York. He took over the entire gallery with this piece, Jungle Jungle, being one of the first pieces the viewer sees on the ground floor as they enter the gallery. And he was really inspired by European mm -hmm. tapestries, such as the hunt for the unicorn, for the relationship to power and the opulence of the aristocracy. And here we can see this piece is dripping with gold and brightly saturated colors. Thank you, Sarah. So that's the scoop. 